Good morning, everybody. We are picking up with the Articles of Confederation lecture, and we're going to finish that, talk about the weaknesses of the articles, and then we're going to move into the Constitutional Convention. So let's take a look at this image here. On the left side, you see some of the powers granted by the Articles of Confederation, which was our first our first constitution in the United States after the revolution was completed. And um, over here on the right, we see weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation. Now, those weaknesses ha uh, created a, a lot of problems in this country. But what you need to remember is that these weaknesses were designed and built into the Articles of Confederation for a reason. So take a look. You see that Congress could not raise revenue through taxes. That's a direct response to England creating taxes, any tax that they wanted, basically, without the people's permission. Uh, colony or Congress could not regulate trade and collect tariffs. Again, a tariff is a tax. And so the power to collect those taxes was not given to the national government. Instead, it was given to the state government, and that was because people believed that they that the individual was better represented at the state level. Um, the fear that the founders had at, during and after the revolution was that the government they created, this national federal government, would have too much power and thus become just like England. So that's why just those two there that you see are uh, those two weaknesses were created. Now, you're going to see a ship. Uh, you might have already seen it, but this ship here shows six different weaknesses of the, or five different weaknesses of the articles. And those weaknesses are no national court system, no power to enforce treaties, no power to enforce laws, no power to raise an army, and no power to collect taxes. All of those weaknesses, again, are designed to uh, weaken the federal government and make people rely more on their local and state governments. All right, let's flip over to your flip over to your uh, packet. We're going to look at pages six and eight. Okay, now on page six we see that Daniel Shays and his rebellion in Massachusetts <clears throat> caused people to realize, whoa, this national government that we have is extremely weak. It can't even protect the people. And so people wondered, is that a, the job of the national government? Is it to protect the people? Well, according to the Declaration of Independence, the national government's job is to protect our rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So there was, so there was a problem. And Reading on page six, you'll see that people got together, like Washington and other important and rich and powerful men, um, got together to start discussing these issues. And they came up with the, the plan to create a new constitution and a whole new form of government. So, um, because without this change, without the government being able to collect taxes and fund itself instead of having to just ask the states or be able to raise an army to protect the states, uh, the country would be thrown into chaos and they feared another revolution because at this time, remember, there were lots of different classes. There are the poor, there are the rich, all upset with this new government. And another, another revolution was right around the corner. So the Constitutional Convention um, began in 1787, and initially it was designed to just revise or change the Articles of Confederation. Another word that we learned from the uh, Declaration is, is to alter, to alter. And that's what they were hoping to do. But instead, soon they realized, eh, we can't alter this document enough it's going to break. And so they abolished it altogether and began making a new constitution. Um, a couple of issues that arose was on page 8, you can see there's a big reading about the Virginia plan and the New Jersey plan, and it culminated or 
you know, finalized into what we call the Great Compromise. I'll leave us here on this slide. The Great Compromise. And the Great Compromise, in a nutshell, is our current form of government. We have three branches of government, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial. The executive um, enforces the laws, the legislative makes the laws, and the judicial judges and uh, makes, sure that, makes sure that the laws are constitutional and good laws. Uh, we have a bicameral legislature. That means that the legislative branch that makes the laws, which is made up of Congress, Congress is actually split into two houses or two groups, the Senate and the House of Representatives. And that's designed so that um, there are checks and balances even among a branch. So um, in, in the Congress, the one house called the House of Representatives is elected by people from each state uh, for a two-year term. And the number of representatives is based on population of the state. So the bigger the state, or well, the more population in a state, the more representatives in the House of Representatives. The smaller the state, population-wise, the less representatives there are in, in the House of Representatives. So large states like Virginia, New York, um, they really ran the, the, uh, the um, House of Representatives, and they still do today. In smaller states, they don't have a lot of say in the House of Representatives. The other house that is part of, or yeah, the other house in the Congress is called the Senate. The Senate is made up of two representatives from each state. And so every state gets the same amount of say in the Senate. And senators are elected for six years of office. And we're going to look in the Constitution and read all of this word for word so that you understand and can see the actual words printed on the page that, draw, that spell all of this out. All right, um, another compromise that was made at the, at the Constitutional Convention was called the Three-Fifths Compromise. See, slavery had already become an issue in the, well, in the states, and other countries like England and France were talking about banning slavery. They actually were banning slavery, and, um, but that just wasn't really going to happen yet in the United States. So people wondered, well, what do we do about slaves? How do we count them towards population? Because, see, slaves were not given rights. They were not given freedom. And so people that did not own slaves said, well, you don't treat these people like people. You treat them as property. So, so they should not be counted as population. Because in the House of Representatives, population in a state equals power. And, of course, those that have power want to keep it. And those that do not have power want to gain it. So um, states in the South had a lot of slaves, as you can see in this chart over here, and they wanted those slaves counted as population so that they could have more power in the government, while um, states in the North did not have slaves, so that they did not want slaves to be counted as population so that they could have more representatives in the House of Representatives. So the plan that was devised, that was made, was called the Three-Fifths Compromise. And it says simply that for every five slaves, you count them as three people towards population. So the southern states, they got some population uh, numbers from their slaves, so they were relatively happy. The north, they kept some of the slaves from being counted, so they were relatively happy. And that's what the whole Constitutional Convention is really focused on and um, and look towards for it's the compromise. Nobody left this play the the meeting happy, but everybody left knowing that they were going to have a better government than they had before. Um,